The Spirit and the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. This is lesson number six in the series and it's entitled Raising Up the Cross of Christ. So as we normally do, a little bit of a review. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so far I've said that God's single most goal is that he wants all to be saved. Because isn't that what Paul says? Who desires all men to be saved. That's what God wants. He wants all men to be saved. So the Godhead, the Trinity, works to this end, that all men be saved. Our study focuses on how the Holy Spirit functions within the Godhead to achieve this goal, the salvation of mankind. Another passage, Paul writes, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now we mentioned that the, uh, the chosen method of salvation was atonement, atonement. This method was chosen as opposed to other methods uh, like a blanket forgiveness for everyone. That's a, a method of salvation. Just forgive everybody. Uh, but we didn't choose that or the Lord didn't choose that. The Godhead did not choose that because atonement fulfilled the need for justice and for mercy to be exercised simultaneously on behalf of the guilty, but believing and repentant sinners. So, the plan of salvation is atonement, vicarious atonement. And so the atonement was carried out by crucifixion, but crucifixion was merely the manner of the Roman death penalty at the time. In other words, it wasn't atonement because Jesus was put to death on a cross. It was atonement because the innocent was put to death in place of the guilty. That's what atonement is. If the death penalty in those days was, uh, I don't know, hanging or cutting off your head or whatever it was, well, they, they would have used that as the death penalty. The idea of atonement is the innocent dying in place of the, the guilty. It was crucifixion because it was the method of that time and also because this method had been prophesied as the manner of death in the past. We read Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, John 12. Again, we're just reviewing the things that we've already talked about. So from now on in our study, uh, the term cross or lifting up the cross will include not only the event that took place on the cross, you know, the death of Jesus, but also what was achieved by Jesus the innocent sacrifice, atonement, which was the expression of God's perfect justice. In other words, the atonement paid uh, for sin. And it was also the expression of God's perfect mercy, the forgiveness of all sin and the saving of sinful mankind. Both of these things taking place at the same time on the cross of Christ what we call the atonement, and what I'm going to call the raising up of the cross. In John chapter 12, I'm going quickly because we're still reviewing. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. We said that the cross, the atonement that it makes, the forgiveness that it produces, the cross, now becomes the historical focal point in God's plan to save mankind. In this passage, Jesus is not only saying uh, that the cross makes a way for all of mankind to come to him, but it also calls all men and women to him, no matter how burdened with sin. Romans 1.16, Paul talks about this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, the proclaiming of the good news, the proclaiming of the atonement. He says, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not ashamed of that message for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, 
So God uses the preaching of the gospel, the announcement of this atonement as the method of calling all men to God. And also the raising up the cross sustains all believers, all disciples are sustained by the cross. It says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. You know, I've heard people uh, discuss this passage and they say, you know, walk it in the light. Walking in the light, you, know, you don't sin. You know, Jesus doesn't sin, so you don't sin. You know, that's walking in the light. But walking in the light is, is not walking sinlessly. Walking in the light is walking with understanding. You know, the, the little light came on, you know, you say the light came on, I understood, you know, I had an insight. Walking in the light is walking, is living with the understanding that we're sinners and that we need the cross of Christ every single day to wash away our sins. That's walking in the light. He says, he says, if you walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, if we were walking in the light, you know, walking perfectly, we wouldn't need the blood of Christ. It's the fact that we're sinners. And so long as we acknowledge that we're sinners and we need the cross, John says, Jesus continues to cleanse us from all sin. And you know, this passage goes on and he says, you know, if you say you have no sin, what does he say you are, right? You're a liar. You're a liar and what else happens? Well, the cross of Christ isn't cleansing you because you're, you're failing to acknowledge the truth. And the truth is that you're a sinner. You're a believing sinner. You're a repentant sinner. You're a sinner, you know, uh, uh, striving to live a life that is pleasing to God, but nevertheless, the common denominator among all of us here this morning is we're all sinners. And so long as we live with the knowledge of that and acknowledge that as the basic truth of our lives, uh, then God promises that the cross of Christ will continue to cleanse us day by day by day. So our conclusion last week was that the Holy Spirit was acting in, act, active rather in raising up the cross as his single activity. All other things before and after are related in some way to this singular achievement and activity by the Spirit. So to raise up the cross therefore means to make plain the meaning of the atonement of Christ by dying on the cross. All right, question. Why the work of the Holy Spirit? Why is it that the work of the Holy Spirit is to raise up the cross of Christ? Why does he do this? Well, first of all, everything that he did in the Old Testament and all that he does in the New Testament is preparation or continuation of this task. Everything he did in the Old Testament, remember we talked about his role in creation, his role in maintaining the creation, his role in creating the, the, the nation of Israel, his role in maintaining the nation of Israel, his role in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus and, and the, you know, everything that he did led to raising up the cross. And everything he's done since then is to continue and maintain the raising up of the cross to the believers, as well as to non-believers. By this activity, all men have the possibility of salvation and it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes them aware of this. So from this point forward, the term raising the cross of Christ will be synonymous with, or a kind of a shortcut 
to expressing the whole plan of God in choosing atonement as the plan to save men and sending Jesus to reveal and fulfill this plan to save men by dying on the cross and then resurrecting him from the dead. You know, all of this stuff that we've been talking about, we're going to compress it all down to one phrase and that phrase is raising up the cross of Christ. Okay, this would be a good place to correct a common error that we make when we're preaching the gospel. I've mentioned this before and I'll even mention it again uh, this morning. We often say that the, you know, when we talk about the plan of salvation, there's five steps in the plan of salvation. You got to hear the gospel, you got to believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These five steps are true and they're easy to remember. However, they are not, let me repeat, they are not the plan of salvation. They're not the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is God sending Jesus to be a vicarious atonement to satisfy God's justice for the sins of all mankind. This is the plan for saving man from the consequences of sin. This is you know, vicarious atonement. That's the plan of salvation. The father chose the plan, he sent the son, the Son revealed the plan and fulfilled the plan while He was on earth. The Holy Spirit enabled the Son and the plan to succeed and to be proclaimed. So if anybody asks you, what is God's plan of salvation? Two words, vicarious atonement. You can, you know, you can elaborate, but that's the plan of salvation, the method of salvation. Well, what about the other stuff? What about hearing and believing and repenting and confessing and being baptized? This is the response to the plan ordained and required by God. We don't dismiss hearing or believing, of course, repenting, uh, confessing Christ, being baptized. I'll talk about that later. Of course not. But these things here are the response of faith. That's how I respond to God's plan. God's plan is to send Jesus to die on the cross to eliminate sin. That's his plan. How do I respond to that plan? Oh, I believe, I confess my faith, I repent, I, I, I'm baptized. That's my response to the plan. You know, uh, so many times we preach the response to the plan as the plan, and we wonder why people don't obey and respond. Well, they don't respond because you haven't actually preached the good news to them yet. The only, only the response to the good news. You know, we, we said, well, I studied with the person, and I'll say, oh, really, what did, what did you study? Well, I explained to them, okay, here's the plan of salvation. You got to believe, you got to repent, you got to confess, you got to be baptized, you know. And, and, they, and they, they didn't do anything. They didn't respond. And I said, well, you know why? Yeah, why? Well, you didn't preach the good news to them yet. There's no good news in that, that you have to repent. There's no good news there, that you have to be baptized. There's no good news. Well, where's the good news? The good news is that the punishment that I was supposed to bear because of my sins Jesus has borne on my behalf. Oh, that's good news. Yeah, the good news is the condemnation that I deserved and that I was going to suffer because of my sins. Yeah, Jesus suffered that condemnation and punishment on my behalf. I won't have to. Yeah, that's good news. The good news is, you know, uh, you're going to be separated from God forever because of your sins. But now because of Jesus, he suffered that. You won't have to suffer 
you won't be separated from God. You have a chance to be with God. And despite the fact that you are a sinner and that you are weak, God has made a way for you to be with him forever. Ah, that's really good news. So what do I do? Ah, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Believe in Jesus, repent of your sin. You see, what I, you see what I'm saying? Very important that we first preach the good news before we ask for a response of faith. So the good news, the gospel, the plan of salvation is that God has sent Jesus to suffer the punishment for your sins in your place so that you won't have to. Brothers and sisters, that's good news. I'm grateful, I'm relieved, I'm happy for this gift. What do I do in response to God's gracious offer of forgiveness for all of my sins? Isn't that what you know, the natural response is? I receive the gift of forgiveness. I receive God's offer of grace by faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, I believe as true the things that he said he said he was the Messiah, I believe that. He said he was the divine son of God, I believe that that is true. I also believe as true what he did, that he died on the cross for my sins and resurrected from the dead to confirm all that he taught was actually true. So I believe and I express the sincerity of my faith, how? By obedience to his command to repent of my sins and be baptized, immersed in water, at which time my sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me. I'll read a familiar passage. Now when they heard, they is the crowd on Pentecost Sunday, when they heard this, what did they hear? We, they heard the gospel being preached by Peter. So when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were guilty. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And I have heard people you know, in the 40 years that I've been preaching ask that question of me over and over again when I've explained the gospel. They say, so what do I do now? Where, where do I go to now? Now that he's done this for me, well, you know, where am I? You know, they, they, 50 different ways of saying, men and brethren, what shall I do? And look what Peter said to them. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children for all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So to get back to our theme of the Holy Spirit and the cross of Jesus, we can say that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to raise up the cross of Christ until the return of Jesus at the end of the world. His work so far has been to raise it up historically. Now he's going to raise it up to men uh, through the preaching of the gospel until the end of time. So how does the Holy Spirit actually raise up the cross of Christ now? We know it's not a literal way like a parade. We often see you know, a clergyman carry a large cross and marching down the road with a crowd during some religious holiday. That's not raising up the cross. The Spirit raises the cross externally and internally throughout history. For example, the external raising up of the cross, ways which can visibly uh, be perceived by angels and men. So how did he do that? Well, he did it before the ancient world. The spirit involved in all the activity, the creation, the nation of Israel, the ministry of Jesus that led to the actual historical moment when Jesus was crucified. What does it say in Hebrews 10.1? For the law, since it only has a shadow of the good things to come and not the, the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continue, continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. 
Everything, the Hebrew writer says, everything was in preparation for this. The spirit worked to prepare mankind for the initial public raising up of the cross of Christ with all that it meant in regards to salvation. And so a historical base to provide context and meaning was established through the sacrificial system. You know, this idea of very, uh, uh, vicarious atonement, that idea was hammered home you know, for, 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 hundred, for centuries uh, through the sacrificial system. An innocent animal is offered up you know, for the sins of, of, of men. The idea of vicarious atonement was well embedded in the Jewish mindset uh, long before Jesus uh, appeared on earth. It was established through the prophetic system. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, it was established through the Jewish nation. You know, they were a, a proclamation. They were a light to the Gentiles, just as the gospel is a light to the world. And so the Holy Spirit was active in all of these spheres the sacrificial system, the Jewish nation, you know, he worked all of these together to somehow raise the cross of Christ to the ancient world through the Jewish nation. Then there is the cross of Christ being raised up before the apostles and the disciples. In Romans 8, 11, it says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit, rather through his spirit who dwells in you. So God raised up the dead body of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Until the resurrection, the apostles considered you know, that everything was lost. Uh, their leader, Jesus, had been executed on a Roman cross they were largely in the state of shock and disbelief. We read in Luke 24, it says, now they were, uh, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, also the other women with them, were telling these things to the apostles, you know, that they had seen Jesus. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. Imagine they're with Jesus three years and uh, you know, the, 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 the holy women, the good women, the followers of Jesus, the ones who saw Jesus first, come and tell them, we've seen the Lord. And I ah, get out of here, you guys are crazy. You know, that's crazy talk. So they were in a state of, they were in a state of shock. This was their reaction to the women who had been to the empty tomb. However, if we fast forward to Acts chapter 1, 21 and 22, we see them not only believing, but they are reorganizing their ranks based on the witness of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit had raised up the cross of Jesus before the apostles, enabling them to understand the significance of this by making them witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Because they saw and heard the risen Christ, his death and its purpose became clear to them. Peter now sees clearly God's plan. In Acts 2.32 it says, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. This is Peter talking. This is the same Peter who just you know, a couple of weeks back says, you people are nuts. You know, what's the matter with you? That hasn't happened. Now he's standing up and saying, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. We've seen it for ourselves. And who engineered that? Well, the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 36, Peter again in his speech, he says, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. He is the Lord and he is the Messiah. This Jesus, and here's the, the point, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's verse 36. It's in verse 37 that they say, men and brethren, what do we do now? <laughs> we, the Messiah we've been waiting for for centuries, we ended up murdering him. <laughs> What's our next step? <laughs> what do we do now? Therefore, 
All of Christ's teachings led to the cross. All of Christ's teachings to the apostles about the cross became clear at the resurrection. And the Holy Spirit, by virtue of his work in resurrecting Jesus, raised up the cross, as it were, to the apostles. Yes, the Holy Spirit raised up the body of Jesus from the grave, why? So that the significance of the cross, vicarious atonement by the Son of God, would be made abundantly clear to these men, chosen and sent to proclaim this good news as their personal witness and not just some new teaching. They were sent to proclaim what they had seen and what they had seen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. He's raising up the cross to the ancient world and now to the apostles. And he also raised the cross before the Jewish nation. This is the next you know, task that he has done that we see. And this was done by the witness of the apostles. In Acts chapter 2, uh, 32 and 36, they made several uh, bold uh, claims, the apostles did. They said they had personally witnessed the resurrected Jesus. That was a bold claim. That Jesus was the Christ, which meant he was the anointed of God. He was the king of the Jews, Isaiah 9 and 11. They were saying that he is the one that fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah. They were saying the hope of Israel was finally satisfied. They were saying that he, Jesus, ushered in the golden period and the last times. They were saying all of these things. They were saying that Jesus was the Lord, not a Lord among lords, but the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We read a little further, 1 Timothy, it says, which he will bring about at the, power, at the proper time, he meaning Jesus, who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see to him, the honor and eternal dominion. Okay, so now all of these claims that they're making, especially if made in Jerusalem, would have been uh, preposterous and would have been met with condemnation and death. I mean, Jesus had recently been killed for making similar declarations. So now these 12 fishermen, these 12 ordinary guys are standing up and saying, hey, we've seen the resurrection. He's the Messiah, he's the Lord, he's the King. He's bringing in the last times. This is it, the golden period has begun and we're here to announce it. Well, uh, what are they doing? They're asking for trouble is what they're doing. They're asking to be, to be executed if the, if the priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees get a hold of them. The point was, could the apostles prove their witness of Jesus' reputation? If they could offer proof of some kind, they would be taken seriously, not to mention avoid being killed for the blasphemy, either by the, uh, the Jewish crowd or the Jewish officials at the temple where they hijacked the Pentecost feast to make these amazing declarations. Well, what do you know? The Holy Spirit steps in at this point. The Holy Spirit raised up the cross of Christ through the witness of the apostles to the Jewish nation. And this witness was confirmed, how? By miraculous signs and wonders. These signs and wonders done by the apostles are often explained using the term the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This means that the apostles were able to do these supernatural things because they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, there is confusion and debate about this term, so let's examine it, shall we? What is the baptism 
of the Holy Spirit. What is the promise spoken of by the prophets? How and when did the apostles receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, I don't want to disappoint anyone, but there is no expression in the Bible that says baptism of the Holy Spirit. That expression does not appear anywhere in the New Testament. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that has been made up uh, by religious groups, but is not in the Bible. It, it, uh, it, it may be inferred, but this phrase that suggests that there's a baptism, you know, an immersion administered by the Holy Spirit, because if it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's His baptism. He administers it, right? Well, it doesn't appear. It doesn't exist anywhere in the, whole, in the uh, New Testament. The proper term used repeatedly is baptism with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew uh, 3, uh, 11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mark 1.8, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, John answered and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 1, I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts eleven sixteen, 16, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Spirit, not of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask the question, is there such a thing as baptism of the Holy Spirit? This term suggests the following that the baptism belongs to the Holy Spirit, that the baptism is administered by the Holy Spirit, or that the subject of the baptism is not the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit does not baptize himself or into himself. Let's read Ephesians 4, shall we? It says, there's one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Note that some 30 years after Pentecost Sunday, Paul writes that there is only one baptism, just as there is only one Lord, Jesus, one faith, a single body of Christian teaching, one body, the church, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, one God, the Godhead, the Trinity. So the question becomes, which baptism is Paul talking about? Because he says there's only one. Is it the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Or is it the water immersion of the book of Acts chapter two, verse 40? Well, you know, 3,000 of them were baptized on that day. Let's read. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of this body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So Paul is still discussing unity within the church. We have different gifts but one spirit who gives and administers all of these gifts so the individual members should remain united and use their different gifts to strive for unity. Here's the punchline. I'm sorry, it took time to get to it. He also says that by virtue of one baptism, everybody was immersed into the body of Christ 
by the Spirit. This is the one baptism mentioned in Ephesians, now mentioned again in Corinthians. So, what baptism had everyone at Pentecost, everyone at Corinth, and everyone at Ephesus received? Well, the answer is water baptism. It began with John the Baptist. It continued by Jesus and his disciples. It was followed by Peter and the apostles. It was still practiced and confirmed as the one and only baptism performed by the church three decades later by Paul the apostle. It continues to this day as the repentant believers step forward to be immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And so from beginning to the end of the New Testament, water baptism is taught, commanded, and received by believers who wish to express their faith in Jesus Christ according to his word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I list only a few scriptures where the Spirit teaches this basic truth. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, go and make disciples, how? By baptizing, in the, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 16, what does Jesus say? Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. John 3, uh, 5, uh, uh, those who are born again, how? By the water and the Spirit. Acts 2.38, we've read it several times this morning, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22.16, Ananias says to Saul, Saul, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away your sins. In Romans 6.3, all who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Galatians 3.27, all who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you uh, as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Well, how do you wash your robes in the blood of the lamb? Well, baptism, of course. So in a way, water baptism is actually the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he commands it in his holy word, given to man to obey and to proclaim. We have all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we were immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Even though the term baptism of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't appear the action appears every time someone is baptized. All right, baptism with the Holy Spirit. So what about baptism with the Holy Spirit spoken by John the Baptist and promised by Jesus? This term is always used to convey a greater measure of God's presence and power among his people. It suggests that the Holy Spirit is given uh, 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 to a person, a king or a nation, is immersed into the Holy Spirit producing spiritual results. One of the promises of the prophets and the prophet Joel in particular was that when the Messiah would come, there would be a greater outpouring of uh, the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon you know, various individuals for, for certain times to enable them to serve God in prophecy or leadership and, and other uh, uh, dynamic ways. Uh, for example, Moses, the Spirit was upon him, in Numbers 11. And Joshua, uh, it is said, in whom is the Spirit, Numbers 27. Samson, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him, in Judges 13. Uh, David, the Spirit was coming on him mightily, 1 Samuel. Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah 61. Jesus, the Spirit descended upon him, Mark 1, verse 10. The apostles, 
baptized with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter one, verse five. Now, all of these references describe the very same thing, which was the empowering of individuals by the Spirit to enable them to perform certain tasks or a certain mission. We read in Acts 1 uh, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and uh, all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. You will receive what? Power, empowering. How? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. So as far as the apostles were concerned, their task was to raise up the cross of Christ to the Jews first and then to the Gentile world. They themselves were convinced because they had witnessed the death and the resurrected Christ, but they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to perform miracles in order to confirm that their witness was indeed from God. For example, uh, people believed that they were credible witnesses because of the miracles they performed, not because of the message that they preached. Their speaking in other previously unknown languages was not only an irrefutable miracle, it was the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah 28, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about that. Now, the promise of the prophets was not only that when the Messiah came, he would bring uh, mercy and healing and forgiveness. We read in Isaiah uh, 53, Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And so they also said that when the Messiah came, not only prophets and kings would have the spirit for a time, but everyone, young and old, male and female, slave and free, would have the spirit and would have him permanently. We read in Acts 2, 17, 18, and it'll, it shall be in the last days, this is Peter uh, quoting Joel, the prophet, God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall uh, prophesy. So the Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to empower not only the apostles to do miracles and to confirm that their preaching was true and coming from God, but everyone would receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit would be with each individual believer all the time. Each repentant believer receives the indwelling of the Spirit not to do miracles, but as a helper to live the Christian life and as a seal of salvation. In him, you also, after listening to uh, the message of truth, that's the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the other thing, uh, the other significance of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is a seal, it is a guarantee that you belong to God, that your name is written in the book of life, that you are guaranteed to be with God in heaven. Some people say, they, they think they received the Holy Spirit and they ought to do miracles. No, they received the Holy Spirit and now they have the strength to live the Christian life and they're guaranteed to be with God in, in heaven. That's the purpose of the indwelling. So I know it's a, it's a lot of material to take in. So let's do a small summary, shall we? Just in case, just in case the, there may have been a lack of attention there in the last 40 minutes. 
Even I was uh, drifting there for a while. <laughs> okay, so let's summarize. The Holy Spirit's activity is centered in preparing and revealing to men the facts or the significance of God's redeeming work on behalf of mankind through Jesus Christ. And I've summarized all of this by using the phrase, raising up the cross of Christ. Externally, you know, proclamation of the gospel, internally, that we understand the meaning of it and we gain the significance of it. Number two, we've examined from the spirit, excuse me, we've examined how the spirit raised up the cross before different groups of people at different times. To the ancient world, through the Jewish nation as a light unto the Gentiles. In other words, it was the Holy Spirit creating, sustaining, enabling the Jewish nation to remain despite its wars, despite all the things that happened to it, it remained as a light unto the Gentiles. That was through the power of the Spirit. And then the Spirit raised up the cross of Christ to the apostles, how? He makes them witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, that's how. And then thirdly, to the Jewish nation, he does this by empowering the apostles in order to confirm that their message, their proclamation of the gospel is true. Why? Because they are performing miracles that cannot be denied. Thirdly, the term baptism with the Holy Spirit is a generic expression describing a heightened presence or interaction with the Holy Spirit. The meaning depends on the context. It can mean two things. It can mean first, empowering. So in Acts 1 verse eight, Jesus tells the apostles that they will be empowered. In Acts chapter 10 verses 44 and 45, the Holy Spirit empowers Cornelius and his household to begin speaking in tongues in order to witness to Peter and the others that even Gentiles are subject to the gospel. And so uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit can mean empowering. It can also mean indwelling. In Acts 2.38, those who repent and are baptized not only receive forgiveness of sins, but also the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's baptism with the Holy Spirit can mean indwelling as well, all right? And we read in uh, Acts uh, chapter, uh, or Romans, excuse me, uh, eight and nine, the indwelling also empowers the sanctification process. We read, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Yes, the indwelling of the spirit enables us to live a sanctified life. Okay, that's uh, the end of this lesson. Next time we'll tackle another easy topic, the title of which is how God works. We're going to take a look at how God works. I thank you for your uh, attention this morning. It's been a long haul, but you know, take a look at the lesson next week and it'll all seem very familiar, you'll see. <laughs>